In Philippians chapter 2 this morning, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles there, pull up on your device, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. We're in a new series today called The Blessed Family. And uh, it'll be a good series covering a number of different topics about God's blessing. This is not just for families, it's for singles too. But if you are looking for a life blessed of the Lord, this is a great series to attend all the messages for. There's a story that's interesting from Japan after World War II. They had some soldiers who were commando slash spy type people who uh, kept fighting for decades after the war was over, after World War II ended. And the military would even go to the places, Japanese military and Filipino military, and drop leaflets, official letters, saying, y'all need to come on home, you know, get in your boat, get some travel, go surrender to Americans or Filipino military and come home to Japan. And they thought, well, that's just a trap to make us a prisoner of war, so we're going to keep fighting. They had gun battles with local police and farmers and all kinds of stuff for decades. And uh, one guy, uh, his last name's Onada. I don't know how to say his first name. I think it's Toronto. Toronto Onada. He fought in a small Philippine island for a long time. In fact, he didn't surrender until March 10th of 1974 at 3 p.m. when a former commander of his personally got on an aircraft and went down there and went to visit him and gave him orders saying, no, it's not just a ruse, you know, we know you're a spy commando guy, and, but it's actually over, the war is over. And he came home, he didn't even believe it for six months time. He actually was kind of checking things out, looking around, seeing if he'd still been tricked. And, um, you know, how was he by himself? Well, he had other people with him. It was like a team of five. Some of them died in gun battles with police and, you know, infections or stuff over decades. But anyways, long story short, he was by himself out there. And here's the deal. He thought that his cause was still ongoing, that he was still serving something worthy. And, but he wasn't the last one. There was actually a guy after him that kept fighting until December of 1974, not just March of 1974, and he eventually came home. And that other guy, the first one I mentioned, eventually became like a, a folk hero in Japan and all this stuff. And his wife was in charge of some huge national Japanese women's thing, all this sort of stuff. But anyways, you know, that can describe you and I for decades. We could live for causes that we're not supposed to live for for decades. It could be a grudge you have, some kind of false thing that you're serving instead of God, something, anything that you really devote yourself to that distracts you from the cause that's number one, which is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, those poor guys, they were so deceived. Look at the life they lost by spending all that time. Well, there's people who are in sadder state than them who are living among us out here for decades have been trapped by false ideas, false philosophies, and false hopes that aren't the Lord God and aren't his will. And so we have to be real cautious in our own lives. Are we being misled into something that's not true? Uh, You know, maybe uh, you believe the best kind of food that's out there is key lime pie. And I'm sorry for you. That's just, you know, that's wrong. You're misled. But maybe it's more serious. Maybe you're a helicoptering parent even though you have an adult child now. And, you know, that's not good. You've got to back off. Maybe you're still providing for an adult child. When, when they turn 18, you know, they need to be providing for themselves. At some point, you've got to ease off. Now, you might help them a little bit and give them counsel and give them some temporary season, but they've got to step up. And it would be unhealthy, like many today, for decades to go by, still living with your parents as an adult. Uh, That would be one example of a false philosophy, an unbiblical philosophy, that's out there today people are living. Uh, We could think of any number of things that are out there. Uh, It could be that some people believe, for example, that they only need to be at church at Christmas and Easter. And they could live that false philosophy for decades and be weaker in their Christian life as a result. Today we're going to talk about this idea of being in worship. So if you'll stand in honor of the reading of God's word, as it did in the old times, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, if you'll follow along. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed, 
in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. We're going to stop there. This is a great passage, but go ahead and be seated. And we're going to deal with these verses, which is plenty, without having to go on verse 8 and beyond. And so the question for you is this. Have you ever missed out on something and then later regretted it? And uh, you could probably identify whatever it might be in your life. You're like, I should have done that, and I didn't. When I was a younger Christian in the faith, I thought that all that mattered was good Bible studies. I didn't see any purpose really in worship except for the occasional showing up at church. And I occasionally went to a church in North Texas. But I went to some really good Bible studies that were tied to some excellent resources. And there was a self support raising missionary who ran all these Bible studies. And uh, for years, I just went to Bible studies and thought, well, you know, I, me, I'm getting fed and I'm learning and I'm getting my questions answered. And I didn't realize that you're also supposed to be in gathered worship. I just didn't know. Uh, You know, maybe I should have, right? You know, shouldn't we all know some things? Yes, but I just did not know. Someone had to actually come to me, a a slightly older, wiser Christian, and say, you know what? You, sir, need to be in worship. You need to come to church with me on Sundays. And so I started going to worship, partly because it was a friend, and then partly because there may be something to this I needed to go see. And I learned that being in worship is something that I should be doing. It wasn't that I was openly trying to flaunt the will of God, as in many circumstances, as friends, family, neighbors, parents, we aren't trying to flaunt the will of God, but we just sometimes need someone to speak a word to us and tell us the truth and invite us to do the right thing. And that can certainly be the case with worship. Paul asked a few questions before he gets to his main point, and they deal with this. Are you truly in Christ Jesus by faith? And we say yes. And so he, he asks the questions. He says, if there is any encouragement in Christ. He says, do you ever reflect on the fact that God has justified you, made you right before him, right before his, his kingdom, the angels, and he looks at you and he sees the righteousness of his son. You're just before God. That means that today, if you believe in Jesus, dying for your sins, God sees his son when he sees you. That means that you are completely just. No one can detract from you, as we were singing about. As Romans 8.1 even says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God sees you, does not see a reason for condemnation. That's an awesome promise. Some people, uh, you know, deceive themselves and say, No, I have condemnation and God hates me. And No, if you're a Christian, if you trust Christ, you're free today. You're adopted into the family of God. When God sees you today, uh, walking around and even in prayer and in worship, he sees you as a son or daughter of his. And all of God's promises are what? Yes and amen in Jesus. And so he sees you, he sees his son, therefore you're in the family of God. He sees you as redeemed. And the purchase price was high, it was the cross. But he sees you as someone he has purchased. Uh, he, he, in other words, he is Lord and master and king. It's a king who controls a country. We are his servants, and he has purchased us for himself. You are clean. You can say, I'm not clean before God. God hates me. I'm rejected. No, if you trust Christ, you're clean. You're declared clean before God. If you have any of those encouragements ever, even one day, that's an assurance that God loves you. He cares deeply about you. Now, you need to remind yourself of those things on a daily basis, right? That's the goal. But if you ever have any of that, you're in Christ. And that's an assurance to you. And that's his first appeal to you. Now, I want us to know context matters when you're hearing the word of God taught. You should always check what you're hearing. And even in a Bible study, and those words in Christ in verse 1, yes, they refer to you and God. You are justified, redeemed, adopted, clean. They also refer to a people that God has who are justified, redeemed, clean, adopted. And you know because verses 29 and 30 in the previous chapter, there, no, there were no chapters in the original. And the previous couple of verses say this, it's been granted you for Christ's sake basically to suffer. That's a summary of them. And who was suffering? The whole church because of persecution. Now we think of persecution like Saudi Arabia. You go there, they cut your head off. That's not what they were facing at this time. What they were facing at this time in Roman areas. Now in Jerusalem, that's a different story. But at this time, early on in the first century, and it changed later, okay, there are different emperors, different reigns, all that stuff. At this time, people would avoid your business. 
if you profess Christ, because you weren't involved in the pagan festivals, and they thought you were disloyal to the empire and your culture, they would ostracize you as family. They'd say, look, you know, um, you know, you follow Jesus, that must be real sincere, you got baptized and everything, you must be sincere about it, you go to worship. We don't want to talk to you anymore. And that would happen. So they were left alone, abandoned, they were they're losing money, and that's initially a lot of the persecution. Now, there were a few people killed in Jerusalem at this point already, but anyways, at this point in Roman times, this church is doing pretty well, not totally persecuted in a sword kind of way, and they're even sending famine relief offerings that are part of the empire as a testimony of the love of Jesus to other people. But nevertheless, they are suffering. You and I may be suffering. You may lose your job because of Jesus Christ now in America. Let's to not deny that fact. That happens to people. The founder and creator of a web browser lost his job because of his views on things. There's things that happen today. It's not imaginary. And uh, there are family members in America today who won't talk to you if you seriously follow Jesus. Now, if you're haphazard and you say it doesn't matter much to me, well, then who cares, right? But if you seriously follow Jesus, there are family members who say that's, that's too much for us please stay away. So what is the point of a spiritual family? You need encouragement in Christ, yes, but also in community. Now you're getting to the point of the context of Philippians 2. You need community and you need a spiritual family, especially as the days get darker in our culture. Now if there's any consolation of love. If you've ever sensed the love of Christ for you, he cares deeply for you. Other people have ministered to you at some point, if any time, even one day years ago. If you sense that and said, that's God. God, he reached out, he cared through somebody. He cared talking to me and I was reading the word and I sensed his love. If you sense that you are in Christ, if any fellowship of the spirit. Now this is so easy to read over and think nothing of, but it's, let's just put it this way. In the original language, Fellowship of the Spirit is both objective, you have with God through the Holy Spirit, and subjective with people, which we miss. Because we think, well, it's just me and God, like I did when I was a young Christian. That's all that matters, me and God. I don't need church. This says the opposite. So we should not say that because God's word says the opposite. Fellowship of the Spirit is both with God and then horizontally fellowship of the Spirit in others. And that's something that's just, you know, go learn Greek if you want to verify it. Anyways, so you need spiritual family. Now we also see affection and compassion. Now Jesus does not need your compassion. He does need your, well, he wants your affection, doesn't need it. So this immediately, you know, it can't only be talking about you and God. Immediately, because of compassion being there. But it also then, you're talking about horizontally among people, affection, compassion. If you ever sense that love of God among people, you need a spiritual family for that. And if you're having trouble in your family, you need the affection and compassion of a church. Does that mean that every Sunday at church is rosy and wonderful? No. But it does mean that overall, God will bless you through a church family. And that's an important point. And Paul says, if you've sensed any of that, you're in God, you've noticed it. So congregational, community, matters in these kinds of things. So what are we looking at here? A couple things. In verse 25 in the previous chapter, it says he wanted to remain with them for their progress and joy in the faith. And then in verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so with all of those admonitions in the background that you would increase in these things and that Paul then for them would be extremely happy and even in heaven today looking out, you would be happy with what you're doing. The idea is this, that you would do something and it's in verse two. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Encouragement in Christ. I am redeemed. I am justified. I am clean. I am adopted of God. You are justified clean, we're adopted, you know, all these things. So we have the same mindset. We belong to Christ. Reminder, he's writing to an entire church, not just a small group and not just to one person. At the end of the day, Philippians was not written primarily just for you to live in your living room, at, read it in your living room at home. It was written for a church family to be read in front of a church family at Philippi, an actual ancient city. And we benefit from it because of what God spoke and God's providence then, the way he forced Paul to write a letter because of circumstances. We benefit in God's plan. He's indescribable, as we sang. But at the end of the day, this is making my joy complete by a church family being intent on purpose, worshiping God so that these things may happen. Consolation of love, affection, and compassion. And so we see 
that by showing good deeds in these different ways, by pursuing God, speaking truth to one another, encourage one another about who they are in Christ when you hear them discouraged, that's what drives you to be in God's will. Worship like that drives us to be in God's will. So where is God's blessing? His will also includes, though it's not totally encompassed by, corporate worship. God's will for you includes being in congregational worship. And that's why in the New Testament, you have images like the church is a body, the church is a household, the church is a building, because it's a whole. It's not just only you and God, it's also the community. So now, we want to listen well today and not just get off track. So something else is important for us, another message. Now, if you go to a soccer game or some kind of different football game this week and you go for the grandkids or yourself, you'll be sitting on the sideline getting sunburned like I've got here from this weekend. And you'll be sitting there, and then let's say there's a great play, your son, your daughter, your grandkid does, and you say, I am so glad I came today. I came just for me. This game is all about me. I'm so excited. I feel so wonderful. I'm cheering today for me. You're not playing the game, but you're cheering for yourself. Now, people will look at you, even unbelievers, like this, like, what is up with this guy, this woman? Like, there's something wrong. And now some people come to church like that. I came to church so I could get fed, so I could be acknowledged, so that I could be puffed up or whatever. And that's not right. You've also got to come to church, not, and it's good to be fed. Don't get me wrong, at church. It is. You want to be fed. It's also important that you would come as a result of seeking others' benefit. You Just like the soccer game, your grandkids, your football game, or someone else you're cheering for, a friend, whatever it is. We cannot imagine that church is just for us. We have to view church as a way to serve others. And that command is here in our passage when it says this in verse 3, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't preach that, pastor. It's going to challenge some things in my life. I've been there. I haven't always been in church in my life. There's years I just dropped out and didn't care. I didn't understand why to be there. Uh, all kinds of things. And I know that too. There's things you want to do. Well, I want to mow my grass and I see some free time there when the church meets. I'm going to use that time to mow my grass. I want to fly out of DFW at 10, 15 in the morning on Sunday. I know I could schedule it Saturday night. I know it. I know, I know, I know it. But I want to schedule it for during worship on Sunday, I'm going to fly out of DFW because worship doesn't matter. I want to go watch an NFL game that starts early. I know most of them don't, so it's not a problem normally. But I want to watch an NFL game early, so I'm going to skip church because it would conflict with what really makes me happy. That's not regarding other people as more important than yourself. That's saying I am most important. I can't figure my schedule out, so just I happen to schedule it during church. And if we view church as just an optional activity that God never calls us to, and we're not benefited from even personally that much, just a little bit every once in a while, we will do that. That's just how it is. And so the idea is this. Worship drives us to do God's will. Now I know, and we'll come to in a second, people go to worship for the wrong reasons too. So don't think we're going to skip that. But you ought to be in worship because that's where doing God's will is. Not just being in God's will, which is being in worship, but doing his will, which means helping others, which is what we want to unpack here. So it's one thing to be in the right place. You're here. Praise God. You're here. Amen. But we don't want to be self-deceived while we're here. We also got to be doing God's will while we're in church. And we can do things the wrong way from selfishness and empty conceit in church as well as out of church. And, but they're both there. We should preach to both. And so here's the deal. If you and I can go to Walmart, Target, or Kroger two to four times a week, we can come to church once a week. We can do that. It's not too complex. We can make it happen. And uh, we understand that's not a huge burden. You know, I personally, just myself, I would love to go work out on Sundays. I'd say, hey, that's great. I could just go for three hours and work out. I could do the gym, then jog. But, uh, you know, well, I don't because I want to be in church. Even if I wasn't your pastor, I would still be in church because I think I've got to be there. And so you've got to be in worship. I hope that you'll adopt that, that blessing mentality because this is where God blesses you. It's in a family. It's not only by yourself. And it is by yourself too. At the end of the day, God will ask you personally in heaven, what did you do with your life? But at the same time, that's going to include what you do with my family and my church. And there's a reason why your picture of a marriage is also Christ and the church, corporate, not just Christ and you. 
That's not the picture of marriage, Christ and you. It's Christ and the church. And so we want to take the mindset of Jesus, Mark 10, 45, and Paul just outlines it here in a couple more verses. He says this, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Regarding others is more important than yourselves. So today, what is your mindset as a single, as a family? I go when I feel like it. I go when it's convenient. I go when it doesn't conflict with my schedule. Worship is optional. Or God may do something with me being there. 1 Corinthians 12, other places, this idea of a household, a body, it has parts. If you take the heart out or the liver out, or you start taking off all kinds of limbs from the church, that's people who are involved in spiritual gifts, suddenly it's crippled and it can't do anything. It's on life support. It's dying. One person can make a difference in a church. And uh, one of the ways is presence. Let me give you an example. You don't even have to know what your spiritual gift is. If you come here and you're willing to pray for someone and to encourage them when you see them. Maybe you know they're going through a tough spot and you pray for them. Well, that's not necessarily a spiritual gift, but it is a, a gift to them, of course, right? And to you in some ways. But uh, that is a way to, to bless someone. Whereas if you hadn't been there, they might have been to still go out discouraged. Now, if you know what your spiritual gift is, we all have at least one, maybe several, several gifts. You can also use that to bless someone else. And that, again, is not merely looking out for yourself, but someone else. Verse 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the other interests of others. King Solomon said this in the book of Proverbs, anyone who isolates themselves seeks their own desire. So now we can reveal what selfishness actually is. It's when you say, well, I don't need to be there. I'm going to isolate myself because I'm tired. I want to do this instead, instead of being in worship. God wants you in worship. And it's not because we know it's best. It's because he said so at the end of the day. And we take him at his word to regard when there is more important. What does it look like? And you might identify with this story in your own life if you were to observe what it means for someone to go to worship, so not skip church, but to go to worship selfishly. Uh, many years ago, I knew somebody who went to worship for that reason. Eventually, he said so. That's how I know. It's not because I'm imagining. And, uh, you know, he was an acquaintance and friends of others, and uh, he was in a worship team. And uh, when he was on the schedule, he would be there. But if he wasn't on the schedule, he was nowhere to be found. And, um, you know, so what? Except, you know, time went by, and you got to see more things. And he was really kind of an unhappy person. And you, you could tell the word of God wasn't filtering in. It was more about, I go there because I'm, I'm famous there. And I uh, was a very talented musician. And, um, you know, eventually came to find out he was so unhappy, he started looking for it in different places, different avenues in his life. One of them included, one among many, he was just sleeping around with different women. And uh, he, he would just uh, find all kinds of partners. And eventually church leaders found out and in love went to talk to him. And he, his response was, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that sums up selfishness and empty conceit, which is vanity, because at the end of the day, he's going to do what he's going to do. And he can turn church in the wrong thing too. And so not being there, being there, you know, and then, he, of course, he took off. He didn't seem to repent. To my knowledge, this person's never repented of sin. And so he's still, it's just what he's going to do and do, you know? So I think that's a problem. And really, the meanest people you'll ever meet in a church are there just for themselves. <laughs> because they're there to feed me, give me fame, accolades, approval. If you don't, I'm out of here. That is the, the harshest person you'll ever meet. So watch out. But Paul says we have this mindset of regard one another as more important. That changes things because then when you get up on Sundays, you don't say, I don't feel like going. You say, God wants me there to bless someone else. It's totally different pictures, totally different priorities. And uh, so what do you do with your spiritual gifts? There's many different needs in any church family. Uh, maybe you should go help out the single mom who's trying to raise a son or daughter. And the dad's not around. Man, you could be here. You could be a father figure in his life. Same thing reverse for ladies. You could be a, a figure in their life when that, that kid is not getting the right influences. But man, by golly, the cowboys are playing. You know, he'll just have to take care of himself. I'll pray for him. No, Paul says regard when themselves is more important and to be there. And so uh, the widower, she comes and she's alone during the week and needs encouragement and she's by herself and then she comes to church and people aren't there to encourage her or lift her up or to, to talk to her and so she is even more isolated on Sundays and so you could be there to serve. The young adult 
who needs guidance and friendship in a dark culture that has all kinds of uh, days where they want to celebrate sin that are on the national calendar and they say, hey, what should I do? And there's no figure in their life because well, I, years ago I helped those people and I can't help them anymore. He'd take care of himself. It'll all work out. The young couple that needs your friendship, they don't know how to handle life, uh, tough marriage questions, different things. You know, you could mentor them, but if you're hit and miss in church once a month, you're not going to know them. And, you know, th- there's been polling, it's been done, it found that about half of churchgoers in America are there once a month. Now, some months have five Sundays. So that's missing four Sundays a month a lot of times. And so you can see a picture of just not being there when you could do something. And I understand there are Sundays when you have emergencies. You have someone in the family who is an emergency. You've got to be there. There's many Sundays when most people say, well, the golf course, the fishing boat, the tourist attraction, a monster truck rally, a game, cutting my grass, reading the newspaper, all look more interesting than being in God's house. And so we need to say, my mentality from now on, because none of us is perfect, I told you my story, didn't I? I'm not preaching to you as someone who does not identify (laughs) with this. You need to understand that God is calling you to a new perspective today and to do his will when you're there. Not just to go. That's not all I'm calling you to. That's all the word of God is saying this morning, to be active. Paul has another good reason for you, to be involved in gathered worship. There's an old pastor in Atlanta, who was going to preach somewhere. And another pastor introduced him with very flowery, wonderful language and speaking of how great he was, great a preacher, great a guy, you know, we're so blessed to have him here. And that pastor came up to the pulpit and he said, I just want to ask for y'all's forgiveness for enjoying what he said and for him saying that. You know, we got to be careful. Sometimes we go because we want to honor ourselves and we need to honor God. That's why we go to worship. Worship drives us to honor God. The Bible says pride comes before a fall. And so we need to understand that we're in worship. We don't go to be prideful. We go to say, I'm going to lift up the Lord as we're doing the songs and pointing to him. He is totally holy. So when we rob him of glory and fame and honor, that's not right because he deserves it all, all of our praise in our lives. So this is a new attitude, Paul says in verse 5. He invites you and I. It's this invitation to change what one is doing, which our culture needs to hear. Have this attitude in yourselves to adopt it, which was also in Christ Jesus. There's a change of mind. And also the idea in yourselves or among yourselves, again, is plural. He's not just talking to one guy or gal, is he? It's a plural. He's inviting everyone in a whole church family to adopt the mentality of Christ. Again, this wasn't written just some Bible study or one person, but the whole church. And um, at the end of the day, the, the mentality is this. Jesus, in a sense, did not have to humble himself for you. He chose to do so as part of God's eternal plan. And he loved you so much, he came to reach out to people who were sinners like me and like you. And so we're coming into worship, we're acknowledging that he is worth it. It's like we're saying, he paid it all, you know, all to him I give. And so we come in with a different mentality. You know, he really is worth it. That's why I get up and I come to worship and I love other people who I don't know and who, if I was an unbeliever, I would never meet. But I I come and I bless them and I'm blessed by them because I want to honor God because he is so totally other and worth it. Psalm 8.4 says this, What is man or a person that you take mind of him? See, God doesn't have to regard you. He chose to out of love. And that's the mindset of Christ Jesus. He gave up the honor, indeed, the the proper praise. We sing holy, holy. In heaven, it's holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. All these praises of God. And he gives it, comes, comes with us, and people insult him and mock him and say, why are you here? Get out of here. Go home. And so, like, he comes and reaches out to people, Because all of us have a stubborn heart sometimes. And he reaches out and says, you know what, this is what I do. I model love. I wash disciples' feet. And before that, for years, he was serving humbly. For example, it's believed by many people that since he was in carpentry as a trade along with his father, he was helping to build a Roman aqueduct somewhat near his house. A lot of the money was there. He came from a very poor neighborhood. That You go work where the money is. And so he's helping build things for the Romans, even though he's the son of God. You know, he's submitting to his parents, even though he's the son of God. And he's growing up, helping run a family business, the son of God. And then he takes his full-time ministry, and he's washing disciples' feet, helping people who 
don't even have a lot of faith, he says, I'm going to help you. You know, so like he steps up constantly when, you know, he doesn't have to. And so uh, his ministry of disciples, really, when they don't deserve it, is an example to us. You could say, well, people don't deserve me to come spend time working, loving on them. You know, that's right. But you don't deserve Christ's love either. So you can do that when you, they don't deserve it. And that's the mentality that Paul says. And that's why he goes on. He's the very form of God, doesn't regard it, doesn't think on that constantly. He empties himself, becoming the form of a bond servant. So he is coming to serve people. And that's radical. And it's so different than our view of God. It's been said that the old English word that worship came from was worthship. And before that, it was worth Skype. And that meant to ascribe honor or heaviness or glory to something. And so we keep that word a lot of times in our Bibles, but the, the idea of worship is giving a heaviness, a weightiness to God because he's worth it. He's totally different and pure and holy and right. So we come and we give him praise. So if we value God little in honor, we may worship little. Or if we don't know to be in worship, we may worship little. Hebrews 10.25 says, some were in the habit of neglecting worship. So again, they're believers, they're loved by God. He says, though, stop doing that. Be in worship, what? All the more as the day approaches. Here we are, millennia later. We should be in worship more than the first century church. And it's much sooner. Christ could come at any time. We live in a dark world where God's Holy Spirit restrains wickedness every day. And so we must be in worship and understand that it's important. Now, what do we have as a challenge beyond this? This can be so valuable to us as believers. We're hearing this. We're saying, you know what? I want to follow God. Um, what can happen for a family? Let's bring it home to this point. You don't want to serve the wrong cause for decades on an isolated island and realize it. Okay, so as a family, what is God's will for you? There is a satire website online called the Babylon Bee, and it has some funny stuff. Um, and some of it's sad funny, right? And one of the things they have on there is after 12 years of going to church once per quarter, two parents are grieved that their child never wants to go to church. It sees it as unimportant, and their relationship with God's unimportant. And they're like, why is that? Well, let me tell you, friends, if you don't value something much, it's going to be hard to tell somebody else to value it. If you say, well, I wish they'd follow God, but, you know, I follow God half the month, then what's going to be the result in your family? So there's a big shift there from just what you should do to what can happen to a family too, or a future family if you're single. And so God wants you to know he has a will for you and it means rearranging things as anything does and being disciplined about it and following his will and not just simply saying, well, I do enough every once in a while. God's will is for you to minister and have ministry. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we come before you today, not as a righteous, really great people, we're so special, but as humble sinners who need a word from you to do the right thing because we would not do the right thing apart from a word from you. So we're grateful that you have buried throughout the New Testament different passages that remind us the importance of worship. And today, you're speaking to us, each of us really, because no one here is perfect, about the importance of worship. Maybe we've been coming to worship and we forgot what it's about. We think that it's about us. Or maybe, Lord, we haven't been in worship it could be a hundred things in the sun with this, Lord, but I know you're speaking to each heart. I thank you for it. Teach us what we should do. And we want to be faithful to you at the end of the day by faith. We pray the Holy Spirit would help us. Reminders, encouragement, days we don't feel like it, put it on our heart. You know what? I can bless someone and go. And so, Lord, help us to be that kind of people, to make it a priority. And not to say, well, it's just optional for times when I'm not bothered by anything else. Make it a priority for us, Lord. Convict us in our heart. Father, for anyone else here who today is thinking, how in the world do you know that Christ is the only way to heaven? And how do you, how do you get to heaven? And what does it mean to be saved? And I'm wondering about those things. Tell me. The answer is this. When we talk about Jesus Christ, who justifies us before God, we're acknowledging a few things with that. When we talk about no one's perfect, what we're saying, we're, we're basically quoting scripture that all have fallen short of God's standard, his glory. And that's Romans 3.23 is what it is in the Bible. And Psalm 51, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, of his standard, and we, we're lawbreakers. And so God sees us as violators of his, his creation, of worship we should have given him, we didn't. 
But then he sent his son to make a way where he could be reconciled to him. And so when we believe by looking to the cross, looking to what Jesus did, he died there on the cross for your sins. When you look to him for forgiveness of sins, you're seen as clean, you're forgiven. God sees you and sees him. But you have to come to a point where you put your trust in Christ. Otherwise, it's just some intellectual idea in Western culture. No, we want to be a personal relationship you have with God. Today, you need to trust him as Lord and Savior, that he died not just for somebody's sins or sin, but your sin. You need to trust him in your own heart and your own words. And you need to say, Father, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I acknowledge that I couldn't do anything on my own. Even as Paul says in this passage, Lord, I admit that I've got to consider my own attempts to make you happy or please you to be rubbish or junk or trash. Because the only thing you want from me is to trust in your son to have salvation. So I turn away from trying to be good enough, trying to claim I'm the right family, just ignoring it. And I turn instead to your son, what he did for me on the cross. And I personally believe it. I accept that he forgave me of my sins. Thank you, Father, that you sent your son to die for my sins. Lord, make me a new person. Change me. Give me a desire for you. Send the Holy Spirit to live with me, to dwell with me, to help me on these days when I'm weak. Father, I want to be in heaven. I thank you too that Jesus rose from the dead and that one day I too will raise the spirit will be reunited with body. I'll be in heaven with Jesus forever because you love me and your love does not end. That's what we sang about. You can say a prayer of that own kind of way, that way in your own words and God will hear it in the simplicity of it and you're a believer today. And I pray that you would be bold enough to tell a pastor, to mark it on a guest card that's in front of you, or if you need to get baptized after believing the gospel, which is how it's always in the New Testament, you mark that too on there. And a pastor will probably contact you and say, hey, how can I answer questions? How can we help you? How can we connect you uh, to a decision um, to be involved in this, to know where to read in the Bible? What is the Christian life about? We can answer questions for you that you're going to have. So I pray you let us know in your boldness there. If you're even so bold, bring it by the Next Steps Connection Center afterwards and turn it in there. But Father, pray for boldness, for decisions. People will step up and make them and not shy back because of culture or whatever else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.